ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯನ್ ಮಹ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಬ್ಯನ್ ಮಹ ಐ ಹಾರ್ಟಿಲಿ ಬೋ ಡೌನ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಮೈ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ದಿಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ನಿಯರ್ ನೌ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ರೀಡ್ ದ ವಂಡರ್ಫುಲ್ ಕಮೆಂಟರೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯಾನಂದ ಆನ್ ದಿ ವೆರಿ ಫೇಮಸ್ ಕಾಂಪೋಸಿಷನ್ ಬಜಗೋವಿಂದಂ ಬೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಭಗವತ್ಪಾದ ಆಚಾರ್ಯ ಶಂಕರ was not only a great thinker and the noblest of advaitic philosophers but he was essentially an inspired champion of hinduism and one of the most vigorous missionaries in our country such a powerful leader was needed at that time when hinduism had been almost smothered within the enticing entanglements of buddhistic philosophy and consequently the decadent hindu society had come to be broken up and this united into sects and denominations each championing a different view point and mutually quarreling in endless argumentations each pandit as it were had his own followers his own philosophy his own interpretation each one was a vehement and powerful opponent of all other views this intellectual disintegration especially in the spiritual field was never before so serious and so dangerously calamitous as in the times of sri shankara it was at such a time when our society was fertile for any ideal thought or practical philosophy to thrive that the beautiful values of non injury self control love and affection of buddha came to enchant alike the kings and their subjects of this country but the general decadence of the age did not square the buddhists also they among themselves precipitated different view points and by the time shankara appeared on the horizon of hindu history the atheistic school of buddhists had enticed away large sections of the hindu folk it was into such a chaotic intellectual atmosphere that shankara brought his life giving philosophy of the non dual brahman of the upanishads it can be very well understood what a colossal work it must have been for a single man to undertake in those days when modern conveniences of mechanical transport and instruments of propaganda were unknown the genius in shankara did solve the problem and by the time he had placed at rest his mortal coil he had wiped the false buddhistic ideology beyond the shores of our country and had reintegrated the philosophical thoughts in the then arya rata after centuries of wandering no doubt richer for her various experiences but tired and fatigued bharat came back to her own native thoughts in his missionary work of propagating the great philosophical truths of the upanishad and of the rediscovering through them the true cultural basis of our nation acharya shankara had a variety of efficient weapons in his resourceful armory he was indeed preeminently the fittest genius who alone could have undertaken this self appointed task as the sole guardian angel of the rishi culture an exquisite thinker a brilliant intellect a personality scintillating with the vision of truth a heart throbbing with industrious faith and ardent desire to serve the nation sweetly emotional and relentlessly logical in shankara the upanishad discovered the fittest spiritual general it was indeed a vast program that shankara had to accomplish within the span of about 20 effective years for at the age of 32 he had finished his work and had folded up his manifestation among the mortals of the world he had brought into his work his literary literary dexterity both in prose and poetry and at his hands under the heat of fervent ideals the great sanskrit knowledge became almost plastic he could mold it into any shape and into any form 
from vigorous prose heavily laden with irresistible arguments to flowing rivulets of littling tuneful songs of love and beauty there is no technique in language that shankara did not take up and whatever form he took up he proved himself to be a master in it from masculine prose to soft feminine songs from marching militant verses to dancing songful words be he in the halls of the upanishad commentaries or in the temple of brahma sutra expositions or in the amphitheater of his bhagavad gita discourses or in the open flowery fields of his devotional songs his was a pen that danced itself to the rhythm of his heart and to the swing of his thoughts pen alone would not have won the war of our country he showed himself to be a great organizer a far sighted diplomat a courageous hero and a tireless servant of the country selfless and unassuming this mighty angel strode up and down the length and breadth of the country serving his motherland and teaching his countrymen to live up to the dignity and glory of bharat such a vast program can neither be accomplished by an individual nor sustained and keep it keep it up without institutions of great discipline and perfect organization establishing the matas opening up temples organizing halls of education and even establishing certain legislations this mighty master left nothing undone in maintaining what he achieved bajagovindam is one of the seemingly smaller but in fact extremely important works of adi shankara here the fundamentals of vedanta are taught in simple musical verses so that even from early childhood the children of the rishis can grow up amidst the melody of advaita the musical rhythm in these stanzas makes it easy even for children to remember and repeat these pregnant verses for an intelligent young man a sincere study of this poem can remove all his delusions maya moha and so the poem is also called moha mudgara mudgara means hammer a popular story describes the circumstances in which this great poem broke out from the inspiring heart of the teacher it is said that once a banaras as shankara was going along with the 14 of his disciples he overheard an old pandit repeating to himself grammar rules and at this futile effort put forth for a mere intellectual accomplishment and thus wasting his time in life without realizing the spiritual unfoldment in himself the acharya is said to have burst forth into these stanzas famous as moha mudgara now popularly known as bajagovindam grammar rules will never help anyone at the time of death while living strive to realize the deathless state of purity and perfection taking the opening stanza as a refrain or chorus to be chanted for emphasis at the end of the following verses tradition has it that the immediately following 12 stanzas were given out by the acharya himself they together go under the name द्वादश मंजरी का स्त्रोत्र वेरी कंटेजियस मस्ट हैव बीन द टीचर्स इंस्पायर्ड मूड एंड द एक्सप्लोडिंग पोएम दैट ईच ऑफ हिज फॉलोवर्स एट दैट टाइम इन हिज कंपनी कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटेड ए स्टांजा ऑफ हिज ओन एंड दे टुगेदर स्टैंड अंडर द टाइटल चतुर्दश मंजरी का स्त्रोत्र आफ्टर लिजनिंग टू ऑल द वर्सेस Shankara blesses all true seekers of all times in the last four stanzas this set of 31 stanzas together titled moha mudgara has been very popular in our country it is but natural that it gets published again and again by various institutions and slowly different types of readings get it to be equally popular some of the alternative readings we have noted here and there in our commentaries the first 1 to 12 verses of this poem 
as it now stands is together called the dwadasha manjarika stotram a bucket of 12 sansa flowers a bucket of fresh blooms is beautiful and rewarding even to look at from a distance similarly even to hear these stanzas chanted is thrilling enough and for the industrious bees that are capable of courting the flowers and entering deeper into them there is always the sweeter honey as a special and extra reward so too to the students who are capable of entering beneath the superficial joys of the metrical rhythm and thus delving deeper into the philosophical implications suggested in these verses there is real, real nectar a consoling philosophy a satisfying view of life in the poem bajagovindam though it is classified as a devotional song or stotram the chorus alone can be truly designated as a prayer verse the rest of the 30 stanzas with the scientific precision dissect the shell of thoughtlessness that weighs the glory in man and forces him to be helplessly stupid in his relationship with the world outside the verses on the whole can be considered as a book of categories in the science of vedanta unlike the other manuals of vedanta atma bodha viveka chudamani panchadashi and others bajagovindam gives within the limited canvas of its composition a more eloquent picture of the art of realization and a deeper diagnosis of the human unhappiness it not only indicates to the students the goal and the path but also reveals unto him the wretchedness of his present way of life the horrors of his present values of life and the dire consequences that await him if he continues to pursue the path of ego and desire this simple looking stotram is not addressed to other equally vehement philosophers and erudite disputants naturally it contains therefore no elaborate logical argumentations to prove shankara's own philosophical standpoint nor has the author wasted any labor in breaking other unhealthy and unholy misbeliefs these are addressed to seekers as a book of instruction to help them walk the path straight to their goal it contains ideas that can refresh the seekers on their path the students whom shankara admonishes with the stanzas are already pilgrims all whom of perhaps are wake walking slow under the crushing load of their own fatigue this is a textbook of advice upadesha and not a book of disputation vada in bajagovindam we meet with a teacher who is softly advising his own beloved disciples in the secret chambers of his own sacred retreat a disciple is one who is taught by the teacher one has become improved has become now relatively more introvert having left the extrovertedness that he had in the past as a result of his study of the contents of this shastra one who controls and curbs the activities of one's own sense organs therefore a true disciple is one who is being taught by the teacher and who as a result of understanding so gathered has now become more and more introvert than what he has he was before and is one who has started independently to curb and control all sense appetites and the vagaries of his emotions and thoughts such disciples were the audience to whom bajagovindam was addressed these 30 stanzas have a crap bip style and effect about them there is no softness no delicate cons- consideration in the approach to correct the erring man it whips up it slashes with a cruel cat's tail on the back of man because of urgency when the house is on fire no formalities need be respected in waking up your respected parents wife or children 
the urgency of the moment demands that they must be awakened immediately thus here in mohamudgara are a few criminally sweet slashes with a kindly cruel whip of horrible impatience coming with a hateful love for the welfare of the beloved disciples still sleeping in samsara sorrows when the house of life is ablaze with death here we will stop this is part 1 we will continue the remaining in part 2 by praying god for all the best to all spiritual aspirants shri krishna arpanamastu shri krishna in maha shri guru bhyo namaha i heartily bow down to all my spiritual dear and near now we will read the wonderful commentaries of shri swami chinmayananda on the very famous composition bajagovindam or moha mudgara by shri shankaracharya This is part 2 verse 1 Bajagovindam Bajagovindam Govindam Bajamudamate Samprapte Sannihite Kale Nahi Nahi Rakshate Drukran Karane Seek Govinda Seek Govinda Seek Govinda O fool when the appointed time comes that is death grammar rules surely will not save you this opening stanza is considered as a chorus and is generally repeated at the end of the following verses bajagovindam is a chant that is generally sung in congregations the leader sings each verse and the entire audience takes up the refrain bajagovindam bajagovindam in this refrain verse the disciple is asked to pack his heart with thoughts of god rather than with his anxieties to acquire hold or possess secular accomplishments or even achievements the grammar rule that has been indicated here stands for all secular knowledge and possessions the grammatical formula mentioned here in dukran karane is from the datu pata of panini's grammar treatise the import of this condemnation that all grammar and such other secular sciences cannot save the soul when death reaches to snatch the individual away from his limited ambit of temporary existence here in the world reminds us of a similar situation in the chandogya upanishad where narada approaches sanat kumara humbly begging for initiation into the great knowledge the teacher rightly asks tell me all that you already know so that i may instruct you on what you do not know narada thereupon gives an endless and brilliant list of sciences that he had already mastered from astro- astrology and astronomy to literature and art music and dance all the varied sciences etc at which sadat kumara says these are all mere names the infinite bhuma is to be realized it exceeds all these it is interesting to note that in the list of narada's accomplishments grammar was also especially mentioned knowledge of grammar is no doubt necessary it is a means to an end to understand rightly the shastra declarations and even to appreciate fully the advice of the teacher grammar is useful but to waste our precious lifetime in the pursuit of all these non essentials and never taking up seriously the study of greatest of sciences which alone can save man from the thraldom of imperfections is being condemned here by acharya shankara for when death comes to erase you out of existence in this manifested world of what use is your science to you of what charm is the art that you have mastered of what help is the knowledge of grammar then while living here man's greatest endeavor is to understand and master the secret of life the reality behind it and to gain his perfect identification with it he must be able to meet death not as a moment of utter annihilation but as a springboard to to rocket himself into an external existence peaceful and divine 
there is a set of optimistic men of mere book knowledge who quote the gita and say that at the time of parting they shall remember the lord and thus achieve all that is to be achieved in the gita it is said one who leaves the mortal coil remembering me is saved book knowledge cannot save us from the unrelenting law the law is the lord even in the gita it is said antakale cha the importance of the conjunction cha is not generally well realized shankara in his commentary explains that this conjunction cha stands for all the life through and at the time of parting the term bhaja means worship it is not merely a ritualistic routine and monotonous flower throwing or a mechanical chanting of some selected mantras or hymns seeking our identity with the lord is true bhajan true seva service but in our in your private chapel or in the public temple the services conducted therein no doubt have been regularized in all religions with the certain codes of instructions this is the only to bring a uniformity throughout the country to go through those movements is at best only a religious drill true bhajan is a total subjective surrender in love and devotion at the altar of lord as conceived by the devotee this process of self liquidation at the feet of lord has been classified under nine types of according to the means adopted one listening to the glory of lord shravanam two singing the glory of beloved of your heart kirtanam three constantly thinking about his nature and beauty smaranam four adoring the feet of lord in a spirit of self obliteration padasevanam five with the help of selected mantras and sacred vedic hymns employing the necessary things prescribed for worshiping the lord archanam six to pay obeisance to the lord vandanam Seven, serving the Lord, Dasyam. Eight, to invoke the Lord affectionately and to discuss with Him as a friend, Sakyam. And lastly, nine, to offer oneself in total self-surrender to the Lord as a humble gift at His altar, Atma Nivedanam. In all of them, there is a spiritual spirit of worship, Bhaja, employed. the essence in all worships bhajanam is service seva ishvara seva is ishvara bhajanam no doubt jnan jana seva is certainly janardana seva the term govinda to indicate vishnu appears twice in the vishnu sahasrama shankara in his commentary explains this team etymologically to mean in four different ways the same highest reality the supreme brahman he dissolves the world govinda in the following four ways he who finds or knows the earth meaning one who has realized the substratum upon which the world play is going on two he who is the lord of the cattle not only as a divine covered boy of gokula as the very life giving factor behind all animal passions and the very essence behind the living kingdom three he who confers speech the very power because of which all living creatures through the medium of speech convey knowledge mutually to each other be it in the betraying of an ass the barking of a dog or the thunderous eloquence of a speaker and for he who is known through the veda text the very supreme reality indicated by the great statements maha vakyas in short govinda stands for essence the atman which is the truth behind the every ever changing flux of things that constitute the universe of our experiments govinda is the brahman of the upanishads he is the highest reality the great god therefore bhaja govindam means seek your identity with govinda the supreme 
and do not waste your time in mere grammar hunting and in such other really unprofitable pursuits of secular knowledge of worldly possessions of ephemeral fame and of passing joys verse 2 mooda jahihi danagama trishnam kurusad buddhi manasi vitrishnam yallabase nija karmo patam vittam tena vinodaya chittam o fool give up the thirst to possess wealth create in your mind divide of passions thoughts of the reality with whatever you get as a reward of your past entertain your mind be content the extrovert personality wanders away from reality to get himself and missed in the finite experience of joys and seeks his fulfillment in the world outside desire for possessing acquiring holding and enjoying is the only motive force that takes man out of his own inner equipoise into the stormy realms of lust and greed by so doing man gets himself involved in the sorrows of samsara although he is really the inheritor of an endless peace and perfection one who comes to suffer from one's own ignorance is called a fool muda shankara hits the nail on the head of the entire problem of the sorrows in the life when he appeals to man to give up the thirst to possess wealth here the term wealth dhanam is to be understood in the largest sense of the term it indicates includes in its embrace all worldly objects of possession with which the possessor vainly feels a temporary satisfaction wealth in itself is innocent philosophy is not against wealth it is not said here renounce wealth but is it is only the insatiable thirst for the wealth that is to be given up desire for wealth is the relationship that the individual keeps subjectively with the objects of the world which he believes can probably give him happiness the objects outside are not to be condemned but man's relationship with them is to be intelligent and chaste when the mind is thus cleansed of passions with the passionless mind one must meditate upon the reality if the mind is withdrawn from its present preoccupations it becomes empty and nature adopts vacuum if the mind is withdrawn from the objects of its entertainment it gathers in itself an infinite momentum and if it cannot discover for itself a creative field of self application it is sure to dissipate itself again into a different set of objects cleans the mind of its lust for objects greed for possessions covetousness for wealth and apply the same mind in the fields of contemplation upon the real the enduring the eternal the practical man of the world at this advice of the philosopher asks a pertinent question if possessions are not to be courted if wealth is not to be acquired how are we to live if a philosopher is impractical the man of the world has got enough common sense to throw up the philosophy and walk his path of joyous fulfillment no honest philosopher can afford to preach something impracticable and impossible shankara here indicates how we must live in the world his advice to us is to live joyously in contentment and satisfaction with what we would get as a result of our actions there is no limit to human imaginations an individual who has given reins to it can never stop at any conceivable point desires multiply the more we satisfy them the more the desires are satisfied the more seems to be the hunger and the deeper gnaws into our peace a sense of tragic dissatisfaction man seeks satisfaction in life but wealth can purchase for us only sense gratifications temporarily no doubt the passion in us seems to be get fulfilled but er long the thirst returns to our bosom to persecute us more ruthlessly and that too with a merciless tyranny 
to discover a sense of contentment and live on what we acquire with our honest labor and not to feed our covetousness seems to be the only method by which true happiness and inner peace can be gained in such a bosom alone the higher contemplation and the consequent discoveries of new dimensions of the spiritual reality are ever possible desire for wealth degrades man attachment brings endless worries there is strain in acquiring there is struggle to preserve intelligently what one has acquired there is pain when one comes to lose what one had acquired laboriously there is anxiety to preserve what one has already gained this is a game of restless sorrows only in katopanishad the young boy nachiketa in his answer to his teacher lord death has beautifully expressed this idea man is never satisfied with his possessions alone again shankara in his viveka chudamani quotes the famous statement of brahadaranaka upanishad and says that the deathless and the un- imperishable can never be hoped to be gained through possession of wealth what we have to live in life is only our sense of covetousness and with this renunciation comes the true enjoyment of the world outside this open promise we read in ishavasya upanishad renounce and enjoy covet not others wealth here we will stop this is part 2 we will continue the remaining in part 3 by praying god for all the best to all spiritual aspirants shri krishna arpanam astu shri krishna in maha shri guru bhyan maha i heartily bow down to all my spiritual dear and near now we will read the wonderful commentary of shri swami chinmayananda on the very famous composition bajagovindam by shri shankaracharya this is part 3 verse 3 नारे स्तनवर नाभिदेश दृष्ट्वा मागा मोहावेश विकार मनसी विचित वारम वारम इन द प्रीवियस टांजा ए ट्रू सीकर इज अडवाइज टू गिव अप ऑल कवेटस्ने फॉर द वेल्थ ऑफ द वर्ल्ड एंड हियर ही इज अडवाइज टू गिव अप लस्टली पैशन फॉर विमेन फ्रॉम द डेज ऑफ ओपनिशर्स to our own times we find in all masters this constant warning against wealth kanchana and woman kamini but no insult is meant to either this is a statement of a scientific truth all intelligent living creatures have these two irresistible urges to possess more wealth and to enjoy woman all living organisms in the world move towards the one great great harbor seeking peace and harmony all are always instinctively wiped up by two definite urges to escape pain and to attain happiness it is only to end all anxieties and sense of insecurity that man runs after wealth to him possessions are barricades against his enemy fear against the besieging troops of uncertainties in life man builds imaginary fortresses around him with money and wealth even a millionaire is found to be not really happy because he wants more when he feels relatively a little secure from fears he feels fully the other urge more and more namely the attainment of happiness it is under this urge that man readily falls to the irresistible enchantments of flesh and runs after the bosom of woman here the statement of man's natural attraction to woman must be understood to include woman's equally natural attraction to man in both the cases sorrow alone is the ultimate destination where they both reach hand in hand biologically nature has made man and woman with a natural affinity for the charms of opposite sex this natural urge is to be controlled disciplined purified and sublimated 
an intelligent intellect alone can achieve this an animal cannot to act according to its instincts and the impulses is but its privilege the glory of man is that he can by his rational intellect curb and control the flow of his instincts for carnal pleasures and redirect them thus ultimately sublimating himself into something nobler and more divine seekers in their early days of practice should find this rather difficult since it is against the very nature of their flesh human body can seek its fulfillment only in the fields of sense objects it is the intellect that always gets visions of the higher possibilities for the attainment of these visions with the help of a trained mind the intellect comes to curb the passionate flow of the flesh and thus turn to the entire current personality into the more rewarding channels of spiritual upliftment it experiences as time passes on a diviner unfoldment within this technique of reversing the process of instinct to flow in the direction of rational contemplation is called in the yoga shastra as pratipaksha bhavana throughout the scriptural text we meet with many an advice based upon this technique here shankara gives us a line of thinking which can be an efficient antidote to the fanciful praise that the body gives to the objects of senses the soft inviting bosom of your beloved if scientifically analyzed and mentally seen in its reality will reveal itself to be composed of only adorant flesh and fat packed in a scaly skin if these component parts are brought before your mental vision spiritually the mind shall immediately retreat from the disgusting ugliness of it all through the practice of this pratipaksha bhavana we can reeducate our mind not to run away with its imagined picture of happiness in the perishable softness of the filth filled body shankara thus with the very opening stanzas of bajagovindam cures the student of his two most powerful fascinations his thirst for the world and his instinctive hunger for flesh when these two are eliminated from a personality it will have no more fuel to jerk it out on the outer fields of its enchantments this cannot come about very readily even when it comes it cannot be maintained so easily millions of lives have we lived in the lower realms of evolution and each one of us has gathered this powerful instinct of self preservation preservation of the individual and the race to rise above them is an achievement in itself and for this repeated varam varam practice is unavoidable in viveka chudamani also we meet with the same idea the objects of the world exist and play their pranks upon us but do we ever see them as they are each one has a knack of throwing a veil of his own fanciful imaginations to decorate the objects with his private mental likes and dislikes thus we see not the world as it is but gaze at the world splashed all over with our own mental contents through close observation diligent enquiry and scientific analysis we can remove the unnatural color that we have thrown upon the objects around us and see them in their native beauty and in their natural forms in the gathering dusk of a dusty evening we may misunderstand the things we perceive in front of us at a distance but on moving nearer the objects with an enquiring mind we shall realize their true worth and learn to drop them as useless money and women in themselves are not a threat to man but in our false imaginations we give them both a ridiculously inflated value 
and striving for their sake we come to lay waste our powers it is this hallucination in man and the consequent illusory fascination for the world which he entertains that exiles him from his own inner kingdom of joy verse 4 nalani dalagata jalamati taralam tadvat jeevita matishaya chapalam vidhi vyadya bimana grastam lokam shoka hatam cha samastam the water drop playing on a lotus petal has an extremely uncertain existence so also is life ever unstable understand the very world is consumed by disease and conceit and is riddled with pangs the previous two stanzas tried to help the student to make a correct judgment of the place of money and woman in a healthy man's dynamic living they are not to serve as treacherous rocks upon which one's ship of life should get smashed and flundered in this stanza acharya shankara is helping us to realize how ephemeral and riddled with painful imperfections is this uncertain existence of the embodied with all the resources that are ever at the command of a great poet shankara seems human life to be as uncertain as a minute particle of water trembling at the tip of a lotus petal life is uncertain in itself and even during its uncertain existence it is consumed by disease and conceits persecuted by a hundred different voiceless pangs in the first half of the stanza he is painting the mortality of individual existence in the second half of the stanza he paints the pain ridden nature of the world itself this is a typical example of pratipaksha bhavana upon the individual and the total life since life is so uncertain and the world is a sense nothing but sorrow the general import of verse is that there is no time for any man to waste death rarely announces his visit and unannounced he enters cities and hamlets flats and fields he respects neither the person nor the place that he visits therefore strive right now now and here seems to be the urgency behind the san sanza we are reminded here of buddha's cry on the same theme with a very similar sense of urgency all is misery all is momentary momentary though i have by now indicated the beauty of the poetic picture in which shankara symbolizes the extreme uncertainty of life the analogy of a drop of water trembling from the tip of a lotus petal has a deeper vedantic suggestion this is unavoidable because poet shankara was at once the incomparable advaita teacher of the world the lotus grows in water exists in water is nurtured and nourished by the water ultimately it is to perish in the water naturally the flower is nothing but an expression of the waters sprung forth to manifestation due to the seed that was at the bottom brahman the infinite the one without a second itself expresses as the lotus of the subtle body due to its own sankalpa existing in the infinite consciousness divine and all pervading the minute ray of it atman functioning in and through this equipment is the individuality atman expressing through the lotus of the intellect is the unsteady over agitated individual which when it leaves the transcends the intellect comes back to merge with the water of consciousness around students of the advaita philosophy can easily recognize in this picture an ampler suggestion than merely a poet's fulfillment in a beautiful picture the return of the trembling drop back to the waters of the lake is the culmination indicated by the mahavakya that thou art verse 5 yavad vitto parjana sakta स्थावन निज परिवारो रक्ता पश्चात जीवते जर्जर देहे 
वार्ताम कोपि न पृच्छति गेहे एस लॉन्ग एस दर इज द एबिलिटी टू अर्न एंड सेव सो लॉन्ग आर ऑल युअर डिपेंडेंट्स अटैच टू यू लेटर ऑन वेन यू कम टू लिव विद एन ओल्ड इन्फॉर्म बॉडी नो वन एट होम कैर्स टू स्पीक इवन ए वर्ड विद यू एस एन एनिमल मैन इज एसेंशियली सेल्फिश ही विल नॉट जनरली गिव विदाउट होप्स ऑफ गेटिंग नथिंग फॉर नथिंग सीम्स टू बी द लॉ दैट गवर्न्स नेचर दिस बीइंग ए यूनिवर्सल लॉ ऑर्डिनरीली इवन इंटीमेट रिलेशंस एंड डियर एंड नियर वंस आर डिफरेंशियल टवर्ड्स द अर्निंग सेविंग मेंबर ऑफ द फैमिली दिस हैज बीन ऑब्जर्वड एट ऑल लेवल्स ऑफ रिलेशनशिप्स मैन एंड वाइफ फादर एंड सन ब्रदर एंड सिस्टर इन शॉर्ट इन ऑल ह्यूमन रिलेशनशिप्स one who is capable of earning and saving alone is with due reverence respected and adored by others around who have some hope of being benefited by a share of his saving it is a popular cry that money is respect and that money can purchase anything and indeed this is true but its corollary which is generally overlooked is rather painful for if money is power then a powerful man of yesterday should necessarily become when his earning capacity is accidentally broken up a powerless man of today if money can purchase happiness the absence of money can procure only sorrow here the capacity to earn and save should be taken in its widest scope since wealth embraces in its meaning all things that can add to human happiness this power to earn and save should include all powers spiritual and secular everywhere or at all the levels in the society the capacity of scientist of the politician of a teacher of a speaker of a manufacturer of an artist and so on human life being what it is faculties and capacities must necessarily wane away since age must sap all physical and intellectual efficiencies keeping this fundamental point or truth in mind shankara says that one can be popular and beloved of the people around one only so long as one is capable of earning and saving then alone others can make use of or make a prey of the rich one when his capacities decay and he comes to live in his own old infirm body all his friends and dependents leave him as he is no more of any use to them this is the sad way of the world this is part 3 by praying god for all the best of all spiritual aspirants shri krishna arpanamastu all spiritual aspirants shri krishna arpanamastu श्री कृष्णा एंड महा श्री गुरुभ्यो एंड महा आई हार्टली बो डाउन टू ऑल मई स्पिरिचुअल डियर एंड नियर नाउ वी विल रीड द वंडरफुल कॉमेंटरी ऑफ श्री स्वामी चिन्मयानंद ऑन द वेरी फेमस कॉम्पोजिशन भजगोविंदम बाय श्री शंकराचार्य दिस इज पार्ट फोर टू बी फोर वर्ड इज टू बी फोर अर्ड knowing this natural tendency of all comfort loving human hearts let the man of intelligence earn as much as he can distribute according to his abilities and enjoy as much as it is his deserts Pop- popularity affection consideration even reverence from others but let him not misunderstand this is to be the very goal of life let him earn inner peace and self sufficiency and let him save the inner peace and tranquility totally independent of all the clamoring crowd around him ever trying to fatten his vanities and feed at all times his conceits this stanza can be considered as providing for the seeker the pratipaksha bhavana against vanities of life through such a contemplation curb the mind away from these false values and deceptive sense of security and turn it towards devotion to the higher 
this can be done only now and here when one is young and one's faculties and the mental efficiencies are at its prime no doubt let all young men seek success in life let them strive struggle and adventure forth let everyone earn save give and thus serve as many as possible around in his community and nation but these are to be considered only as hobbies the main occupation of life should be the art of self purification the craftsmanship of seeking perfection the real achievement is to be gained in one's own personal inner contemplation so that even long before the world comes to reject you you can reject the world of activities and retire into a richer world of serener contemplation and more intense self engagements verse 6 yavat pavano nivasati gehe tavat pratyati kushalam gehe gatavati vayav deha paaye bariya bibyati tasmin kaaye as long as there dwells breath life in the body so long they enquire of your welfare at home once the breath life leaves the body decays even the wife fears that very same body a sense of detachment from the blind affection for the world and from the objects of hollow enjoyments is absolutely necessary in order to turn the mind towards seeking through contemplation the truly highest in the certain text this idea is slightly over emphasized as in buddhism which is no doubt dangerous in as much as it takes away the pep of life and dulls the very enthusiasm in the seeker to live or to strive meditations on life should not land the student at the bottom of some dark pit of lifeless pessimism at the same time he should not be blindly optimistic about the worldly achievements and the brittle vanities of life vedantic teachers are very very careful while they try to dissuade man from over indulgence in a totally extrovert life they vehemently exhort all to live in service of man and to develop in themselves a healthy introvertedness the rishis no doubt with an ideal scientific detachment had observed life as it is and with their relentless honesty had painted it all with shattering realism only to help the student to realize it all fully this culminates only in a healthy optimism and where the student's old values are shattered vedantic teachers are very careful to substitute for him a set of healthier and more enduring values of positive living western critics not realizing the implications of such stanzas generally criticize adversely because they jump to the conclusion that philosophers in the east paint life dark and dreary and thus are trying to drive away from man all incentive to live live and to progress in short so to spend one's entire lifetime in sheer body worship in earning more so that this futile worship may be made more elaborate is one of the abominable intellectual stupidities into which humanity readily sinks for if the body be the altar of worship it may not remain permanently there as the days of decay and old age are not far away even for today's young bodies to set and toil to fight and procure to feed and breed to clothe and shelter the body or all the in themselves necessary but to spend whole lifetime in this alone is a criminal waste of human abilities for it is to grow old tottering infirm and in the end die away to live in the body for the body is the cult of the rakshasas the virokshana cult virokshana the king of the devils even after reaching the feet of lord of knowledge could understand 
from his instructions only this much the body alone is the self the atman the eternal to worship it is the greatest of all religions here in the stanza a line of contemplation is opened up and to reflect in this direction is to end the attachment with the body and to blast all the futile vanities in man at least the animal body has some value when it is dead a human body when once dead has only a nuisance value it is to maintain and to fatten such a bundle of disapplicable filth that wealth is earned hoarded many throats cut low dissipation practiced and cruel wars waged even the nearest and the dearest your own life's partner points out shankara dreads the and fears the darling body of her beloved husband when once life has ebbed away from it to med- meditate on this significant fact of life is to develop a healthy disregard for and a profitable spirit of detachment from the body when it is no doubt the body is to be looked after for it serves us keep it clean and beautiful feed it clothe it wash it just as we serve all other vehicles that we make use of in the world serve the body but always with a firm and steady understanding that this is only an instrument with which we may win the ampler fields this will not remain forever nor will it serve with equal efficiency for all times it will perish and it must verse 7 balastavat krida saktah sarunastavat taruni saktah ruddastavat chinta saktah prame brahmani kopina saktah so long as one is in one's boyhood one is attached to play so long as one is in youth one is attached to one's own young woman passion so long as one is in old age one is attached to anxiety at no one allows to the supreme brahman is is ever seen attached indeed life is short long is the pilgrimage high above the clouds veiled by them rise the peaks of perfection that are to be scaled and at the rational intellect is so powerful a mechanism that it can rocket a man of pure heart into the highest levels of incomparable divinity in a very short time if only he is available available for it alas he is not he gets himself tied down to the passing sorceries of the flesh in the world deluded by his fashions he discovers an enchantment in the gold a value in the baser things a sweetness in the very bitter agonies of life hoodwinked with lust drunk with passions the tottering fool wanders away from the main road into the thorny bushes and there lacerated and bleeding soon fatigued he tumbles down into the bottomless pits of death as the teacher realizes this universal folly of man he feels a painful desperation and the resultant song is the verse under discussion chronologically following the autobiographical story of man the acharya says that the childhood days of man are wasted in his attachments with the toys and the games natural to that age as he grows up the youthful energies are dissipated in his passion for his beloved and in lusty sports as age gathers upon him and forces him to bend upon his staff the gray hairs on him conceal a head heavy with anxieties and fears all through life's pilgrimage the fool crawled upon the surface attached to one thing or the other never getting any chance or finding the time to attach himself to the supreme play passion and the pang these seem to be the three common boundaries in every thoughtless man's life no one born can struggle against the flow of time or against the law of growth the days of ball and doll 
must yield their chances to the times of passion and woman and then at the evening of life he arrives to leave his worries and anxieties regarding himself and others depending upon him strange enough never did he get any leisure to surrender to him who is the sole protector of all the all giving guardian at all times this extreme sense of attachment to the world is to be given up intelligently so that life may have a goal a mission or at least a purpose this extrovertedness is natural to all living creatures but in man this is inexcusable the other creatures live as commissioned by their instincts man has the freedom to rationally judge even his own inclinations temperaments and tendencies and reject them when they are found to be foolish and dangerous it is in this special aspect that man is the roof and crown of things if well employed he can raise himself to the highest perfection around us in the world we find man is never idle but is ever active plepens and playfields love arbors and romance world hospital beds and infirmaries these are the usual fields of his achievements and industrious activities all the time life constantly ebbs away and there is no time for him to think of him the supreme katopanishad indicates that the very creator has made man's sense organs turned outward and so he lives generally at the sense level and can feel a sense of fulfillment only in sense indulgences it is only some rare ones says the glorious kata rishis who desiring to realize the highest withdraw themselves from the preoccupations of the senses and seek the changeless and the immutable to be attached to the lord is to learn to withdraw from the usual fields of pain ridden sorrows the ephemeral gains at the shocking losses to turn to god is to attach ourselves to him and by this attachment any sincere seeker can bring him bring about an efficient detachment from the ever changing realms of objects verse 8 kate kanta kaste putraha संसारोयमतीव विचित्र कस्यम कह कुत आयाता तत्व चिंत तदिह ब्राता हु ईज युवर वाइफ हु ईज युवर सन सुप्रीमली वंडरफुल इंडीड इज दिस संसारा ऑफ होम आर यू फ्रॉम वेर हैव यू कम ओ ब्रदर थिंक ऑफ दैट ट्रुथ हियर देर इज नो डिनाइंग द फैक्ट दैट द इंस्टीट्यूशन ऑफ होम the bonds of family relationships etc have all a beneficial influence on individuals and they can certainly liberate man from his egocentric selfishness and at they are themselves even at their best very limited they can never be an end in themselves man and women living together in mutual love and respect as a couple and growing to the dignified status of father and a mother have much to learn from each other both get well trained by their mutual association if they live in a true spirit of togetherness but ordinarily in their folly they grow into such an unhealthy state of attachment to each other that the very bomb becomes a poison according to hindu shastras man and woman in a wedlock must live no doubt in a spirit of togetherness but the acharya insists let there be space between the two let there be no clinging attachment to each other which is unhealthy for both here we will stop this is part 4 we will continue the remaining in part 5 by praying god for all the best of all spiritual aspirants shri krishna